Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. It's part of the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Series. It's titled Embedding Change Management into Your Continuous Improvement Initiatives. Hi, I'm Mark Graben. I'm your host. I'm a senior advisor with Kinexus. I'm happy you're here, and I'm very happy to be joined by our presenter, Melissa Sherman. Um, I'm going to more formally introduce Melissa in a minute. You'll learn more about her background and her contact info will be on screen during the Q&A. Real quick about Kinexus. Uh, if this is your first time attending one of our we webinars, uh, we want to welcome you on, on behalf of the entire Kinexus team. Kinexus is an enterprise platform uh, that's designed to drive continuous improvement and transformation across organizations. If you'd like to learn more about Kinexus, please visit our website at www.kinexus.com or you can scan the QR code that's there on screen. Next, please. One final quick announcement. This will be more of interest to our Kinexus customers, but registration is open now for Kinexicon, our ninth annual Kinexus user conference. It's going to be held as usual in uh, lovely Austin, Texas. If you'd like to learn more, go ahead and register. Go to kinexus.com slash kinexicon. Okay, one more slide, please. And now I'm pleased to more formally introduce uh, Melissa Sherman, who I've, I've met a number of times through uh, the Michigan Lean Consortium. Really happy that she accepted the invitation to be here today. Melissa is an accomplished lean leader. She's a sought after speaker who's recognized for driving continuous improvement initiatives and, share, and sharing change best practices. So it's great that we have here her here today to talk about change management. Um, she's uh, honed her craft over more than 30 years of experience in process excellence. She has a, a holistic ability to drive enterprise Six Sigma, Lean, and Kaizen deployments, and has delivered quantifiable productivity, efficiency, and waste elimination gains. So um, a, a lot of experience to tap into. I'm really excited that you're here, Melissa, so I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for the invite. Uh, I'm excited to be here too and to um, get in front of all the people online. Um, I'll say to you, Mark, because I know you're watching the Q&A. Um, if something comes up while I'm going through a slide, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt. Uh, sometimes okay. it's easier to answer then than try to go back later. So I am all good with uh, the potential interruptions from that perspective. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Again, uh, welcome uh, to the Embedding Change Management into your Continuous Improvement Initiatives. Uh, again, your speaker here, Melissa Sherman from the west side of Michigan, and it's actually sunny out today, so that's a great thing. So let's jump in, right? Um, what is continuous improvement? Uh, it's one of the most widely used tools uh, for continuous improvement model is that four-step uh, assurance method of plan, do, check, act, or some know it as plan, study, adjust, act. And what is change management? It's that systematic approach to dealing with the transformation and transition of an organization's goals, processes, or technologies. All right, the purpose of our change management is to implement strategies for effective change, uh, controlling that change, and helping adapt uh, people to adapt to that change. I always like to throw this in here before we get started. So what we'll really be doing over the next few slides is really comparing the phases of a PDCA with the phases that um, I'll just say I've coined for change management, um, right? We have our systems that we look at. So if we think about the letters here or those elements, those are the different um, problem solvings or changes that we have going on. And then they're connected. So for example, here in this, you can see B and C are connected but B is also affecting H, H is affecting G, right? And so as we think about this holistic um, problem solving, continuous improvement and change management, we have to be cognizant of all the other changes that are happening within our business. So one, we can make sure it's sustainable and that um, people are understanding what change they're doing and how it's affecting um, their processes. So with that, we'll jump in. Um, so phase one, you. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware, or if not, right, it's that plan phase in our continuous improvement where we are defining and breaking down that problem. We're grasping for that current condition and setting our target condition. 
while we're doing this, we should also be thinking on that change management side and defining what that change is, right? So I know we're in planning. We haven't gone through the whole eight steps of problem solving, so we don't know what our impl implementation is going to be. But we can start to align and clarify on a clear definition of what the change is going to be and when, who's going to be most impacted, the criteria for success, and then review those changes over the flight to align with uh, the right time for the change. So many times, as I mentioned right in that previous slide, we've got a lot of things going on. And is the time that we're doing this large, maybe large implementation, the right time if there's other things affecting the employees? The other great part in this phase, uh, specifically defined on that change management side, is you get a little bit more in depth of who your stakeholders are, right? So it's not just that silo, I'm fixing a problem, let's say in accounts payable, where we fix it and then we don't realize how it affected accounts receivable or how it affected an engineering group or supply chain. So it's really allowing you to dig in and get those stakeholders so that as you're going through your problem solving, you've got them aligned to be your champions and you've got the right stakeholders to solve the problem. Uh, I've always loved this quote by Albert Einstein, right? If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend that first 55 minutes thinking about it and about five minutes thinking about the solution. And that's true, right? The hardest part in our problem solving is typically defining what we want to solve. <laughs> So phase two, still in that plan area, right? So we're still looking at um, that step four, step five, you know, conducting your root causes and getting your gap analysis, identifying those potential countermeasures. Now, as you flip and start really thinking about how change is implemented and affecting this, we're looking at that, what I've coined as a design phase in change management. So again, utilizing those closest to the work to identify and document those key activities and timing that's needed to achieve and sustain measurable results, right? Um, I'm not sure about you guys, but you know, how often do you go through an eight step of problem solving in your implementation and you lay it out and then everybody's going, oh, wait, what, what's going on, right? It's too late to bring the people along in most cases. So this is just, again, helping you meld the two together as you're going through your change management, excuse me, problem solving. Step three is really getting into the do, right? So we did, we planned, and now we're doing on our continuous improvement journey. We're developing, we're testing those countermeasures, we're refining and uh, finalizing those, and then we're implementing them. On that change side at the same time, right? Implement, we're doing, we're implementing, we're working together. We're performing that plan change. We're monitoring to making sure we have the results, acting accordingly if results are not being achieved. So if I think about continuous improvement, where we focus more on our implementation process, right? Is the process what we intended? On the change side, it's really thinking about are the people doing the change as we said, right? Are they implementing that new change and are they sustaining it? and staying with it. So as soon as I walk away, they're like, oh, hey, we can go back to the old way to doing, right? It's really starting to meld those two together. <clears throat> and step four is that study, right? We're measuring our process performance. Is our implement our Im implementation um, getting the intended results we wanted, whether it's you know reducing the human struggle or um, dollars or whatever it may be, Again, still focusing on the process. Now, as we think of that change side, we're really looking at reinforcing those behaviors of the employees so that we're supporting them, strengthening them. Um, we're measuring that stakeholders adoption to the new way, right? And validating that what we've implemented, they're adhering to and can continue to do that. Um, yes, the numbers are important, but right, we need the people to do them. So it's really just, again, um, embedding them into the business. As we get into um, phase five or that adjust phase, right? We're refining, we're standardizing and we're stabilizing our process on that continuous improvement side. We're monitoring the process performance. We're evaluating results. We're starting to share our learnings. Again, and this is at that same time that you're also evaluating the people, right? 
determining that the change achieved has the success measures you were hoping for. Again, understanding what went well, what could have gone better, building those lessons learned so that we can, again, enhance the process, go back and continuously improve and keep um, the morale higher for our employees as we go through this. So liking to start bringing it all together, right? Um, you, you had all these little pieces, now we're gonna bring it back together, right? So um, your planning is a couple phases, your do, your study, your adjust, right? As we look at what it is and the correlation on that change side, right? Defining, designing, implementing, reinforcing, and evaluating, right? The goal of change management is to evolve, equip, and support our individuals to transitions to accelerate the realization of business benefits, right? This framework provides people-centered approach that guides leaders and coworkers through the change. This framework also focuses on developing our beliefs, our behaviors, and our actions, right? So our belief, or my belief is I believe I have the ability to change and be successful. My belief supports the new behaviors and actions required to be successful. Now, on my behaviors, I know and I can change to evolve my behaviors to be successful, right? And then actions. I understand and can take the action required to be successful. So it's really around those three little pillars of beliefs, behaviors, and actions that allow us to be sustainable through our continuous improvement and our change initiatives. So as I think about this, this is, a, this is an example that um, I happen to do uh, in, in my day job of uh, work management. So we went through, we've done a value stream, we have our dis different Kaizen um, bursts that are in there, went and put them on an impact versus effort diagram, right? And said, oh, we want to focus on scoping as an example. So as soon as we start focus on scoping, and I go all the way back and define what I need to do. For example, in this case, it was our project change notices. Um, we're continually asking for more money because our scope wasn't deep enough. So as soon as we got who needed to be involved, we could bring on change management. So as we worked through this problem solving, we had the right stakeholders. We had the advocates to talk through and say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how we're changing. And then we've done that, you know, that PDCA. So we planned, we do, we implemented. Um, luckily in this one, it was a, a delta of about $3 million. Uh, so that got everybody's, you know, interest and um, excitement up. And then we could continue to roll through and make the next change. So again, if I go all the way back right to the first one where we have the elements and the connections, um, my scoping is going to connect us to designing, right? And working us all the way through on this. I'll pause quick if there was any questions that came up yet. Um, Mark. Please. No, Melissa, no questions coming in uh, so far, but again, I'll encourage people feel free to submit questions anytime. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So no another example that I like to try to get to this is interesting. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> There's a couple of hidden slides in there. <clears throat> um, many are familiar with DMAIC for their continuous improvement or ADCAR um, as their change management. And so this is another example of how the two um, work together, right? Um, as we define in our DMAIC and its awareness in ADCAR, we're making relevant uh, stakeholders aware that a change is being considered or planned. As we're in that measuring phase, we're developing that compelling business case to make the desire for change, right? How do we move people forward? We give them a desire. And then we identify that knowledge gap um, for the potential changes we are analyzing and to make. And then we have that plan on how to train the new, new ability, right? So as we're improving, we're looking at that ability side of to make. And then there's that control and reinforcement at the end. Um, in our PDCA, or in this case, DMAIC. Now I'd just like to take a few minutes to walk through some different tools 
um, that I've used in my continuous improvement initiatives along um, with that change, um, embedding that change. <clears throat> so I'm not sure how familiar, familiar many are with the change curve. Uh, there's a plethora of them out there. Uh, this is uh, the Kubler-Ross one. So if we think about this, right, it's, uh, you know, you've got that that curve you're going through. And unfortunately or fortunate, the best example that I can always come up with that has affected all of us is COVID-19, right? <laughs> um, when we first heard about it, I was just trying to think about this, almost four, almost five years ago now, um, right? We're, a lot of us were in shock, right? We're at that far spectrum, that far left spectrum of surprise or shock that this is even an event that's happening. Then over a course of time, right? Some of us went through denial, right? We had a disbelief looking for evidence um, that it wasn't true. Unfortunately, right? The numbers showed us it was true as we watched the tragedy across the world. Uh, then some of us would go into frustration, right? We recognize that things are different um, and we were very angry on it, whether it was because we had to work from home um, we may have lost a loved one or somebody we knew. We couldn't go out to dinner anymore. We couldn't do other activities. So we were very um, frustrated with the process of events that were happening. Some went into depression, right? That's that low mood, uh, lack in energy. So we would, you know, couldn't do anything. You're stuck at home for months until things started to um, lift a bit, right? Then we can't, some people went to experiment, right? So that's the initial engagement with a new situation. So with here, I like, uh, I talk about a lot of times, or I have no friends, I should say, that would go out to dinner every Friday night. COVID hit, they couldn't do it. So over time, they figured out, oh, we can experiment. There's still a local park we can go to. We can sit at picnic tables. We can have our distance. We can still have dinner. We can still converse, right? So that was an experiment. Uh, and then some went to decision, right? That's learning how to work in the new situation, feeling more positive. Um, I would say probably most of us, unless you're in a service industry where you're, you know, a hospital or uh, maybe some of the banking or a utility where you had to be there, right? To keep, keep lights on or keep people healthy. Um, you had decisions to make. Did you continue to stay at home and work? Did you find a different job? What did you do? So we learned how to work with that new situation and feeling more positive about that situation we're in. And then lastly is that integration, right? Changes were integrated and we had a renewed individual, right? So we found a new, is what we call it, the new normal, right? We found a new way of doing things. So I really like to use that example as I talk to change because when we are in our continuous improvement, not everybody's in that same location. There could still be today people that are in shock and denial of COVID-19 right? We still need to bring them along. Or there's people that are frustrated uh, or depressed, right? And there's somebody that went right to the integration. So as we do that, we have to realize that if people are at different stages and how can we work with them to bring a majority along and do what we need to do to, well, I'll just say help the stragglers. So I'd like to share this one because it's just, and I know, Mark, you said you're going to share the the deck, but if somebody takes a screenshot, that's fine also. Um, we are very um, tool-oriented individuals many of the time. Um, in, in either instance here, right, tools are there to guide us but not be the defining um, factor. Um, but I'd like to relate the the similarities between change management, and in this case, to make, and what tools are very similar, right? So again, that green, that first phase there, um, both change and to make are defined, right? We have a change summary, which is very similar to a project charter. We look at uh, change resources or people, uh, RACI, and we have success checklist. On that to make side, right, you're getting the voice of the customer. You're doing value stream mapping. When you get into that next phase, of that design, again, that stakeholder analysis. So stakeholder analysis is making sure you don't necessarily have to say all of the people, right, but what organizations are going to be affected by this change or this problem solving that we're doing. Now we look at stakeholder engagement, and that's where are they at 
on this curve in their engagement on that change that's coming forward. Um, one thing that I like to do where I'm at is instead of saying, oh, they're in denial, they're frustrated, they're they're um, depressed. I like, it feels to be more tagged. I like to use the different emojis that relate the symbol, like a frowny face or you know a happy face or a frustrated face. Um, you have a change plan, so a plan of what you're going to do. Again, you can see that success, success checklist used throughout. And then on that measure side, right? And when we're in our problem solving, we're process mapping, capability analysis, doing Pareto charts, making sure we want to go after uh, the right problem. Uh, and then through implementation, a lot of the same, right? We have uh, the plan, the engagement, the checklist. On our domain side, we're looking at those root cause analysis, our FMEAs or our multivariate charts. And when we get into reinforce, uh, the newest one in there, well, actually, they're not, right? We have change summary, again, the analysis engagement of our stakeholders, um, using that change plan and that success checklist. So the importance here, right, is we don't do the stakeholder engagement back in design and then it goes off on a shelf, right? We need to pull it back up. So as we're reinforcing our employees, we're like, okay, Joe, he was um, a, a huge you know, component of this. His engagement before was, eh, he's not too happy with the change, but now we've got him here. We're able to reinforce and move him along. Um, in the DMAIC right, Improve, we're looking at those design of experiments um, and potentially using Kaizen events. And then lastly, in that evaluate control, right? We're still looking at our change summary, our change plans. Um, important to do those lessons learned, making sure we've checked off everything on our checklist. And then we're having our control plan, our, our SPC, our doing our 5S and mistake proofing. So here's an example of what um, I've used for a change summary. Uh, I like to just share it out there for uh, the folks to see. So obviously, right, we have our project name. Um, but the big thing here is really describing that current state and the challenges that we're expecting, right? So a lot of times we'll put a project charter together or not, depending on the depth of problem solving. Um, but we don't necessarily take the moment to go, how will this implementation and this improvement affect the end user, right? Um, we put in here, what does that future site, uh, excuse me, future state look like? Again, uh, sometimes we've jumped to conclusions in our change initiatives because we'll say, oh, we want to implement uh, an incident command system for X, Y, and Z, and we have our future state, but we never really went back and had a problem that we were defining to confer that our future state was the state we needed to get to. But it just helps you think a little bit outside of that box and move forward. I mean, and the biggest thing is why is this change required? Again, we're looking at this through a different lens than what we would necessarily be doing in uh, a, a simple problem solving event itself. Um, and then, you know, again, what is the scope of the change? I mean, there's some other things in here, you know, when would it occur if, or what would occur if this change fails? Uh, so what would occur if this implementation fails, right? So just looking at our, our risks, our stakeholders, there's a new budget, hit, um, budget constraints, um, and what our success criteria would be. Next, I'd just like to walk through um, a little bit of Cotter's eight steps. So again, there's a plethora of information and data and uh, items out there. You know, Cotter's not the only one for change management. Uh, as I mentioned, right, there's Acuity, there's ACMP, there's Add car, there's a bunch of them, but the nice thing with Connor is uh, in his eight steps, it also helps relate, right? So that step one is that of action, right? We're really increasing that urgency. And the behavior we're expecting is to people start telling each other, let's go, we need to do this change. We need to do this thing, right? If we wait until we're into the implementation, it's harder to increase urgency although we probably feel it's more urgent because <laughs> we're closer to implementation, but getting people on that journey early. Uh, step two is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, building the guiding team. So uh, this is looking for that group of powerful uh, enough to guide a big change um, formed and they start to work well together. So looking for your change advocates 
for that initiative. Um, I'd like to, you know, just stop for a second and say, you know, not everything needs change, right? If it's something to just do it, you know, the rugs holding the door from shutting, we don't need change management, but it's those really big rock, big initiatives in the company where you really need to bring those in, those individuals in. Uh, step three of his, the action is right. Get that vision right. Um, our behavior is to guide a team development um, for the right, right vision, the right strategy um, for the change effort. Step four is communicating that buy-in. So people begin to buy into the change and this shows that their uh, shows in their behavior. One thing I like to state here is communicate is not just written. It's not just an email. Um, it's not just a blog. It's not just a podcast. It's not just a one way. I'll just say like the webinar, right? Where it's me talking and not feedback back. I mean, I realize there's the chat, but it's not a two way communication in this case. So when you communicate to your employees, you may have to do five or six different types of communication. So you hit many of them. Uh, step five then is that empower and action. So the more people feel able to act and they do act and then they're on the vision, right? Step six is really looking at creating short-term wins. So that uh, behaviors, momentum builds as people uh, try to fulfill the vision while there are fewer and fewer resist to the change. So another Thing that I'm just aware of in my time is that as a project team that's working on uh, the continuous improvement effort, bringing that change in, we as a small team may, may celebrate our wins or milestones. We may not, but we don't share it with others to celebrate with us. So it's really making sure all are involved in that celebration. And it doesn't have to be a pizza lunch. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's just, hey, a simple Thank you, milestones that we've reached and let people know where we're at. Step seven is don't let up. Uh, people make wave after wave of changes until the vision is fulfilled. And then lastly is making that change stick, right? Goes right back to our PDCA of ACT. So making sure it sticks. New and winning behaviors continue despite the pull of tradition, turner, turnover of change leaders and et cetera. Um, I, that's probably one of the biggest challenges, right? Making it stick. Uh, next up, I have just a couple different books uh, that I like to reference that is that have helped me greatly in my change initiatives working with employees. <clears throat> so if you haven't heard of it, there's a book called Switch by Dan Heath. Um, very good book. It talks to um, directing the writer uh, motivating the elephant and shaping the path. And this nine block is really great to help you think about different items, you know, finding bright spots, scripting the critical moves, um, pointing to the destination, right? That rider wants to have a path. They want to know where they're going. Where the elephant, right, is looking at finding the feeling, shrinking the change, growing the people. Um, I like to Probably not accurate, but I like to relate it to a writer as an engineer. They want a direct path where they want to go. And our people and culture, our HR group is probably more of that feeling, sensing type group. And they want to make sure that they've got the people side of it together. And then, right, the last side is shaping the path, right? So tweak the environment, build the habits, and, and rally the herd. It's really great to use this as you build your communication because you can hit both of those spectrums or all of those spectrums um, with that communication. Another book that's out there that I um, like to use also, and I will take little nuggets from all of them as I'm, I'm working on my change initiatives, but that's called the influencer model. I apologize, I'm drawing a blank on who the author is right offhand, but this is a six block and it just shows you that iterative cycle of Right, you have the six sources of influence, which I have on the far right side, um, that find the vital behaviors that clarify um, measurable results, and it's going around and round. So, if we think of us on a personal level, what motivates us? Right, make the undesirable desirable. How do you motivate an individual on that personal level? And then, what's their ability? How can they surpass their limits? And then, if we think on that social level, right, we want to, although I remember telling my kids, don't let peer pressure get you. And this is in a positive way, right? Harness that peer pressure so that people will come along. And then what's the ability? Find that strength in numbers, right? What's the uh, old analogy, right? 
many hands make light work. So find those numbers to help bring it along. And then lastly is that structural. So um, under motivation, right? Design rewards and demand accountability. And then that, and then in that, mm -hmm. the ability is changing the environment. It, it's to do it collectively. Not one person can change an environment. It's bringing many along in that journey. Melissa, I'm going to jump in real quick. I put a link to the book called Influencer in um, the uh, the chat for those who are um, looking at that. Uh, th that book was written by a whole team of like five people, Melissa. So Thanks. I don't I don't blame you for it. Takes <laughs> that was many, one many, I cannot remember all of them. <laughs> many, many book writing hands make light work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Sure. Um, and then uh, the last book that I really like to relate to is Change Intelligence, right? We hear a lot about emotional intelligence and uh, there's you know a plethora of them out there. And so this is really looking at um, you as an individual. So it's by Barbara Trey Lawton. I do know if you buy the book new, so not a used book, there's, uh, there was, uh, a link to do a free assessment on this. And it's really looking at, do you lead with your heart, your head, or your hands? And I find this ironic for myself um, after I took it. Um, I don't know if we alluded to in the beginning or not, but right, I have an industrial engineer. I've also been told I'm not like a typical engineer, so I'm not sure what that means uh, until I took this. So I really thought my highest score would be in my hands. I like to be a hands-on individual. Uh, and so can't find it offhand here, but um, Mark, you know me. What do you think my highest score would be? Heart, hands, or head? You know uh, it's not hands right now because I just told you that one. Would it be in that facilitator middle ground? Um, at, actually, I am 100 uh, heart or a coach. Uh-huh. Uh, then I kind of lead with my head. So I have 70 wow. at head, which is a visionary. Mm -hmm. And then I am 30% with hands or, or an executor. <laughs> yeah. Not even close to what it makes sense because yeah. I love to do this and, and get in front of people. But I'm like, huh, not, I would not have thought hands would have been the lowest. So again, this is just another great way for individuals to understand where they're at, um, like a disc assessment or strength finders. If you do it as a team, it's great to see where your team is because you can find where your pluses and deltas are and how you can work together um, and help influence that change, right? So if I'm working with somebody that I know is an executor in hands, I'm going to look a little bit differently in how I can speak to them and share with them so they have that hands on. If I know somebody that's more in that visionary, I need to give them, okay, in the three to five year, this is what this change is going to do and what this is going to look like. So not, just another good book that I think is more of a self-awareness, but it's really great as we think about um, the changes we're going through and how we can um, bring people along on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the, the pluses and minuses of social media. Um, I did come across this one time on social media and it just really struck me. You hear a lot of times, go slow to go fast. Uh, you know, take one step at a time. And this picture really depicts a lot to me, meaning right the importance of a smaller step. You can see the individual on the, the smaller steps together is like all the way to the top where the other individual is can't even can't even reach that first rung. So it's important to take those small steps, um, get it close to right the first time versus jumping ahead and wanting to get further and taking those big leaps of faith and having to redo um, a majority of it. So I just like the the value of this picture for me is just really, like, you know, take a baby step at a time, work your way there. Um, you'll get the same outcome or better by doing that versus trying to take those big leaps. So again, I, again, I know you're sharing, but if somebody wanted to, uh, grab a screenshot fine uh these are just a lot besides my own stuff these are a lot of the books that are related to um throughout the discussion right so the barbara Treylot and change intelligence obviously from ad car switch um and then uh, chad breyler's improve last book is where i stole a couple of the uh, pictures out of and then just some of the other tools in there 
I don't know if I'm ahead or on time, um, but that is it from a presentation perspective. Mm -hmm. So we can open it up for any questions that uh, anyone might have. All right. Um, thank you, Melissa. A lot of uh, great frameworks and, and tips that you shared. Thank you for fighting through sniffles and <laughs> coughing. Um, you, you, you're a trooper. So thank you for um, being there for us here today. Um, we've got a bunch of questions. I encourage people to continue submitting those and we'll do um, a few announcements, give Melissa a chance to um, sip some water and um, cough if she needs to or <laughs> can't hold that in forever. But um, next slide, please. Oh, that's just me. So quickly, I'll pause if anybody wants to yeah. uh, scan the QR code. I love to connect um, with individuals on LinkedIn. And then I love it if we all find out we're at the same conference together and I get mm -hmm. to meet you in person. Um, one of the things I enjoy is building those um, personal relationships mm -hmm. uh, throughout my career mm -hmm. in life. As we've done at the Michigan Lean Consortium. Yeah. Conference, to give a plug again. For, I'll uh, just say I attended the Lean Solutions Summit last week, and it was great to meet like Katie Anderson mm -hmm. and Tilo and Nigel. And I mean, there was just so many of them, I couldn't even name them all. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, Patrick Adams, I heard, did a great job. Yeah, it was another good event, conference. Uh, Michigan guy. So um, that QR code will be on the, uh, the final Q&A slide as well. Oh, perfect. I can move us forward then. Okay, thank you. So uh, a few announcements. Um, this is part of a, a monthly webinar series. We call it, again, the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Webinar Series uh, because you registered, if you registered for this one and you're attending live, you will get notified of future webinars. If you are watching or listening to the recording, you can go to kinexus.com slash webinars and sign up to be notified of future webinars. Our next webinar for, no for November is still uh, TBD. So um, again, we will send out that notification. If you're part of our Kinexus community as a customer or otherwise, and you have a topic that you would like to um, to share and, and present, we're open to that. Please email me mark at kinexus.com. All of our past webinars are in our webinars on demand library, which you can find at kinexus.com slash webinars. And you can also find webinars on our YouTube channel. Just search Kinexus. Next, please. I invite you also, uh, we, we offer, we're happy to offer a lot of free resources for our customers and our broader community. That includes our blog. You can go to blog dot kinexus.com uh, a couple of times a week um, there's a lot of great content written by members of the kinexus team sharing their background uh, experiences and, and perspectives so again please check that out uh, next we also have our podcast the kinexus continuous improvement podcast all of our webinar recordings are put there in audio form hopefully you heard uh, the preview discussion that melissa and i did there's always a lot of great stuff in the podcast feed. So please go to kinexus.com slash podcast, or you can find us pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. Next, um, your feedback matters. You, you should have a survey in your browser, or you may have a, a pop-up that appears when you leave the session. Um, we, we found we get a better response rate on the survey when, when we make this appeal. We do read the feedback, we do share it um, with the presenters and, and we take your ideas for future webinar topics. So please do, if you have a couple of minutes, um, fill that out um, when given the opportunity and, and thanks for doing so. I say Next. I appreciate it, positive and negative. Well, we always <laughs> ask people what went well and, and what opportunities for improvement. Absolutely. Um, One of those opportunities for improvement is me figuring out a better way of sharing the slides where it doesn't give a 404 error on the link for some people. I need to, <laughs> I need to troubleshoot that. Continuous improvement. <laughs> we try. So, all right. Um, so there's Melissa's email address and her, her LinkedIn uh, QR code. She says she loves to connect. There are hearts in the QR code. Isn't that <laughs> right? Those little hearts in there. There yeah. are. I, I, so please do. I was creative. <laughs> Uh, so please do connect with Melissa. All right. So let's see. The, um, there's no one best order for these different questions. So uh, I'm going to start uh, here. Um, Melissa, I think thinking of John Cotter's change model and, and that important first step, um, there's a question, how do you create urgency 
in a positive way um, without fear or reprisal. Yeah, so um, it all comes back to the why, right? Why are we doing this? And if we don't start with the why, um, we'll just say rumors spread in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have that negative effect more often than positive. So in order to start off with that positive uh, and that urgency is explaining that why, what's the benefit, you know, what, ironically, I'm going to be speaking at ASQ in February and my topic is what's in it for me? Why do I want to join your continuous improvement journey, right? And it's really starting with that why to get people involved early. Um, and then once they're on board, it helps you with that urgency to move it forward. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think maybe also part of the question it looks at um, maybe get your your thoughts on this. You know the pos the the negative framing and look as an engineer, I'm guilty of framing <laughs> the the opportunity as a gap with the problem, right? A gap that that might be seen as negative. Turnaround times are too long in the hospital lab. Quality defects defects are too high as opposed to framing it in a positive of we could delight the doctors and patients by reducing turnaround times. We could delight the customers and grow our business by reducing defects or improving quality. Like I, I'm curious your thoughts on like the positive or the, if you will, negative way of framing the same situation. It, right. So yes, I'm going to do the, the whole right. Yes. And, um, mm -hmm. Uh, is I, I think you're aware, right? I'm a huge advocate of audiobooks because I drive so much, but one of them is making numbers count. And um, a little bit of a long answer, probably. The human brain can really only fathom to the number five. Once you get past that, it's just like mumble jumble. So, you know, if you say, oh, we want to improve, you know, turnover rate by a hundred, we're like, what's a hundred, right? Or we want to do um, another example is an LED light bulb lasts seven years. Does seven years mean anything to you, relatively speaking, right? Now, let's say you're a parent of a, of a newborn and you can say, hey, by the time your son or daughter is in first grade, you'll have to replace that light bulb. Now we can click it and make sense of it. So right to what you're saying is how do we put it in a... I hate to say a softer context, but really that's what it is, right? A mm -hmm. softer context to explain that, yeah, we, we know we're going after a number for an improvement, but what will that get us, right? More customer satisfaction. Um, I like to turn it to, um, I flip it, life work balance versus work life, right? If we can reduce X amount of defects, you should have X, potentially right, X amount of time that you can spend with loved ones at home. So mm -hmm. liking to put the personal twist on it, uh, I, putting the twist on it and also getting that personal aspect and it making, if we go back to switch, right? Thinking of that elephant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, thanks, Melissa. Here's mm -hmm. another question. Um, with the change summary document you shared, who's responsible for completing that? Typically when I've been involved, um, we've had a, change management um, group within our organization within the company, and you will get a change leader uh, or change advocate coach assigned and they work through it. Um, I'll just say, unfortunately, it hasn't been um, as prominent in the past um, couple of years to have that change team. And uh, so I'll say I do it because I was in change before I came into our lean organization where I work on a daily basis. So it's typically me, um, but really anybody can. Um, I would relate it to the owner uh, of the project. Uh, anyone really should take ownership and be able to fill it out. And it should be collective too. It shouldn't be just one individual doing it. It should be the team. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Here's another question thinking about um, you know the different phases of change. So the question asks, when you're using any of the change management tools, how much should we emphasize the phase that we are in or moving to is communicating that an important factor in a project? Um, I don't want to say I don't think it's important. The average individual isn't going to know or really care what phase you're in, mm -hmm. right? Even if you think of problem solving, if you're working with somebody, do they really know or care that, you know, step five is root cause? They just know you're working on root cause. Mm -hmm. um, or you're working on implementation. So I wouldn't get hung up and say, oh, we're in the define phase and this is what we need to do. 
it's getting that communication mm-hmm. out and relaying it to the employees. Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, there, there was a comment on the question. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it and, and see if there's, you know, the thoughts you have, Melissa. Um, you know, Brian says his answer to this question is he thinks it depends on the audience. If I'm talking to project teams or change management teams, they like to know. But I find people are not aware of the steps of change management that they 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 might not necessarily find it helpful. That sounds pretty similar to what I think you were yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, you get the project manager in there. They're probably having those phases as milestones. Um, so they're going to want to know where you're at. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you had to report out to a CEO, they might want to know what phase or what milestone you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, but the average employee really, it, it doesn't affect them either way. They probably would be um, overwhelmed with mm-hmm. laying a phase on to the information you're giving them. Yeah. And when you think about the um, the Kubler-Ross model, right? Yeah. Um, You probably, it's probably helpful to know the model as opposed to going out and throwing those different words directly at a person. You seem depressed about the change right now. This will pass, (laughs) right? Yeah. (laughs) So in in the conversation I had last night when I was actually doing this presentation, I said, you just don't go up and say, hey, Mark, how do you feel about this, right? Mm-hmm. You you kind of are that fly in the wall, if you can be, and you go into a room, and as the change is being shared, you capture the, the body language, the looks on the faces, and just make some notes, right? It's not, again, you don't want to label somebody. That's why I try to use the emojicons versus words. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, it's the same relationship, but it doesn't seem to be as targeted as a word. Mm. And I mean, I think the the one thing you said that stood out to me, I I, I think is really, uh, really wise is recognizing that different people will go through that change process at different rates for a number of different reasons. And I think just recognizing that is helpful. Absolutely. So I appreciate you um, bringing that up. Okay, here's here's a a question. Um, This is interesting. Maybe if change management hasn't been a focus from the beginning of an initiative. So the question asks, says, our company has implemented a new structure and employees are still doing their old ways and roles. They, I assume uh, the company or leaders, want to hold workshops to go through the change management process. What's the best tool to use, uh, quote, after the horse has bolted? (laughs) Hmm. Uh, That one's always a struggle. Um, again, I always like to go back to the why. Mm -hmm. Yep. We might've missed that why the first time and just said, thou shalt do and thou shalt are not doing. So now we're trying to retread and and get back there. So I'm not saying workshops are not the right way. Depends on how the workshop is set up, uh, that you want to make sure it's a true workshop. So for example, Uh, when we rolled out uh, continuous improvement at an organization I was at, it was, yep, here's the eight steps of problem solving, go do. And then it became a a, 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 a goal or a metric that X amount of employees would go through a level of problem solving training in a year. But then we never went back and said, hey, are you implementing, are you doing? So same concept, right? And so now it's like, okay, let's do a workshop that allows them to have more hands-on to understand, to move it forward and explain the why. Why are we asking you to do this workshop? And what is the benefit when you, I don't like to use the word to comply, but when you um, embed this change into your daily basis. Yeah. And, you know, I think whether my, my, one thought that comes to mind is whether it's happening later or even in the beginning. I think if if somehow the tone or implication of a change management workshop is sort of blaming people for not going along with the change, like I don't think that's that's helpful. You might get compliance more than commitment. And and I think, you know, recognizing these stages of change helps us, like you said, not label people, but instead like lean into the conversation about understanding what are what are your concerns, what are your ideas. Um, I, I think to 
help that be a conversation um, and instead of, let's say, a change management lecture, which I know is not what you're suggesting, <laughs> but but I think that oh. happens, right? Oh, absolutely. I'll just say one thing um, that's been a benefit for me. If I have uh, individuals wherever they're at in the spectrum, right? Um, on, for example, right, you've got the survey you're sending out. Uh, some people might be not have confidence in filling it out how they really feel, um, which we find a lot of times with engagement surveys or other change initiatives going on. I take the time and um, set up one-on-ones, 30 minutes saying, hey, I understand. I, I got this feeling that you didn't, weren't buying into this or that you're, you know, again, finding the right words. Can we just talk? I want to understand where you're at. How can I help you? And then on the flip side, if you find the enthusiastic person going, hey, I can see you're enthused about this. What, why, why are you, right? And get some of those, um, get the, he'd say it, right? Get that data and understand how you can work with the rest and, and then bring them along. It, I'll just say, unfortunately, in the age we're at, we're in a lot of technology that we forget human interaction is our best um, friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, just another question. Um, what's a successful way to identify advocates for improvement or change um, sort of through the what kind of skills or temperament people have? Anything in particular? Is this left to management to decide? Um, I would say not left to management because they make the assumption of who would be the, the best person, right? Uh, and it's going to depend on the change and what organization or organizations it might affect. Uh, I'll say a benefit of working at a place for a long time, you get to know a lot of people and you understand uh, their backgrounds and their enthusiasm or lack thereof. Uh, and it might just come down to that, you know what, I think Joe might be a good person. Let's see. And he might say, yeah, I'd love to, but I don't have the bandwidth, right? And so he's not going to be as engaged. You could have somebody that has the bandwidth, but they're just not the, I hate to say a people person mm -hmm. where they might just be disgruntled. So um, you won't get it right the first time, the fourth time, the hundredth time. Mm -hmm. uh, you just kind of have to go with your gut within reason and know who it is. And uh, it helps by building those relationships up front to know the best uh, individuals mm -hmm. uh, to bring along on that journey. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what are the bad assumptions leaders might make, like giving up on someone like, oh, they've got a bad attitude. They don't like change. Maybe that's unfair. I've seen um, I have just seen um, more times and I'd like to admit that they think, oh, Susie, she would be really great. She She's not doing much for me right now. She's got time. She can come help. But oh, Susie yeah. may be way in that denial phase mm -hmm. and not even be interested in change. She likes status quo. Um, right. Or they pick it on, uh, maybe not all the right reasons to be the true advocate. The leader might be against the change. So he's going to make sure he picks, he or she's going to pick somebody that they know won't be a proponent for the change. So, mm -hmm. um, it, it makes it difficult. Um, a lot of times you can turn them, but it, it is challenging. Yeah. And assumptions often lead to mistakes one way or yep. another. So, um, Maybe um, might be our last two questions. And you know, I think these questions most of speak to some of the challenges that people face out there. Um, whether it's you know, leader, you know, even looking sometimes at, at, at leadership and their embrace of change. But there's a, a question here. Um, how to motivate site leaders or senior managers for change when they prioritize short-term output? and profits or figures. For example, the daily operations meet their targets while they might be sacrificing sometimes the quality of the process. So it's kind of like the analogy of, I have my day job and you want me to do this continuous improvement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, I hate to say it, I sound like a broken record, but it's still going back to that why, right? If we can explain the why and how we can meet those daily objectives, we can spend time on value added work versus non value added work, right? And if you can, I should say, if when you can buy in and see that or have the aha moment, now that team is more apt to come with suggestions to make it even easier, 
more efficient and better so that you can meet that um, that quota even better. Uh, I'll go back to the example that I mentioned earlier, right, where we wanted to get X amount of people through a training that now as an instructor, I'm teaching for three hours and half of the people are just there because they have to check a box that they went, hmm. not because they're going to apply. So now there's waste in my time and their time. So if we explain up front why we want you to take this training so you can do X, mm. your outcome should be a little bit more promising than not having that information mm -hmm. or sharing that vision. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 I think a couple of the models you shared could apply here. We might need to appeal to the head and the heart and yeah. the hands, right? So, I mean, what's logically true that improving quality can help you boost your production targets might feel uncomfortable or scary or like, well, how about we try something with our hands and see how it works? Um, yeah, try it's maybe, you know, it's a matter of know, knowing the leader, or at least trying to experiment to figure out what appeals most to them. Yep. And, and finding out, right, what, I don't know how to say this, what type of person they are, right? So are they asking that directive because that's what they want? Are they asking that directive because that's what their supervision supervisor wants, right? And mm -hmm. how do you work um, to, I don't want to say alleviate, but how do you work to build that relationship to, again, um, get it so we got more, mm -hmm. more buy-in? All right, then um, last question uh, says, as a, a very specific example, my organization is in the process of rolling out scorecards. What advice would you give middle management and senior leaders whose actions and behavior are not aligned with their words? <laughs> um, Tough question. That's a hard one. <laughs> uh, When I've had that, and again, right, it's not necessarily on that change management side, but when I've had that challenge, um, I like to ask how those metrics on their scorecard are relaying back up in a KPI tree. So I would assume that the organization has overall metrics that they want to hit in a year. And then as you go down through the organization, you you get more minute in those um, metrics and then really understanding how they tie back and then question what what is our gain by doing this now not every metric is going to tie back to the top kpis right but it's what are we doing to help those metrics or help the company move forward not what am i doing to make potentially my boss's bonus better right or or make him look better or she look better it's really being able to be able to ask those Socratic questions on how it ties back to the overall corporate goals. All right. Well, tough questions, but thank you. You're, yeah. off, you're, <laughs> off, the, you're off the hot seat, Melissa. <laughs> but thank you <clears throat> to everybody for your questions. Uh, best wishes to everybody who is working through change management challenges and, you know, um, encourage everyone to dig into the different books and frameworks and resources that Melissa shared um, today. So you're going to a lot of thank yous in the chat. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, so Melissa, thank you again for, for doing this today and really appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem. With it. Again, thanks Mark. And then just for those that are still on, right. If they haven't dropped already uh, again, reach out on LinkedIn, connect. I'd be more than happy to have any side conversation uh, with anyone, uh, if nothing else, being a listening ear uh, to help, because I know it helps to talk with somebody outside of your industry uh, to maybe have a different perspective. Well, I hope people will reach out to you and, and connect. So um, thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, we'll see you in November for uh, our next webinar. And again, if you're part of our Kinexus customer base or a broader community, feel free to reach out if you've got suggestions, if you've got something you would want to present, I'd be happy to work with you. You can email me, uh, mark at kinexus.com. Thanks again, Melissa. Thank you.